Well, as you can see, we had a lot of fun at Vacation Bible School this year. Yes, uh, and I want to thank everyone for just the absolute wonderful week that we had. I want to thank all the parents and grandparents for bringing your kids and grandkids. I want to thank the kids uh, for wanting to be here and actively listening, listening and participating. I also want to thank the church uh, for making vac Vacation Bible School possible. VBS does not happen without your prayers, without your financial support, or without your volunteer spirit. I also want to thank Julie and Carly for co-directing this year. Uh, VBS can be chaotic, but you help run things very smoothly. And, and last and most importantly, though, I want to thank our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because 2020 taught us that we should not take anything for granted ever. Uh, and so being able to have Vacation Bible School this year after not being able to have it last year it is something that we need to thank God for. Uh, indeed, thanking and praising God for who He is and what He has done, that was a very big part of our Vacation Bible School this year. In fact, Psalm 145 verse 1 was our featured memory verse for the whole week, while Psalm 145 3 was our verse for the day on Monday, and portions of Psalm 145 verses 1 through 6 were also part of our Monday scripture video, so I thought that it would be appropriate on this day, in which we are celebrating yet another successful Vacation Bible School, that we would look at Psalm 145 in its entirety. So uh, we don't have any slides today because we're not really going to be jumping around very much, but Psalm 145, we're going to look at all 21 verses, verses 1 through 21, Psalm 145, let's read it together. This is God's holy, authoritative, inspired, and inerrant word. Psalm 145, verses 1 through 21. A psalm of praise of David. I will enthusiastically praise my God and King and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation will commend your works to another and will declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They will utter the memory of your great goodness, and I will sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All you have made will praise you, O Lord. Your saints will extol you. They will tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all men may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and holy in all his works. The Lord upholds all those who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving towards all he has made. The Lord is near to all who call on him and to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. This is the word of our Lord through David. And we know this through David because 
Psalm 145, the title says that the Holy Spirit inspired King David to write this psalm. Uh, indeed, the Bible indicates that David wrote at least 75 of the 150 psalms. And there are good reasons to also believe that David wrote some of the psalms that are technically anonymous. And, and so David wrote uh, over half of the psalms, far more than anyone else, which is why 2 Samuel 23.1 calls David the sweet psalmist of Israel. But Psalm 145 is the last of the psalms which specifically identify David as the author. And so what's interesting, though, about the title of Psalm 145 is that this is where the Hebrew title for this whole book comes from. Uh, that title in English being Psalm or Song of Praise. The Psalms are nothing less than the ancient hymn book of Israel. And like hymn books today, the, the book of Psalms was added to and, and rearranged under the guidance of the Holy Spirit throughout Old Testament history with Moses writing the first psalm, which later became Psalm 90, and Ezra likely writing Psalm 126 after the Jews returned from exile in Babylon. And it is fitting that the entire book of Psalms would take its name from Psalm 145 because Psalm 145 is all about, as we just read, praising and blessing the Lord for who he is and what he has done. Now, getting into the psalm itself, uh, most translations of Psalm 145.1 say something like, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. However, that word extol is not a word that quite honestly, any of us use very often, if, if at all. Uh, and it's definitely not a word that any of the kids at VBS would have known. Um, uh, it, but the Hebrew word behind extol indicates something that is high, something that is lifted up, something that is raised up. And so instead of using the word extol, our giant VBS banner, if you saw it in the fellowship hall, said, I will enthusiastically praise my God and King. And I think that is a perfectly fine translation to use instead of extol. But praising the Lord with enthusiasm is how we show just how high and just how lifted up and just how great our God truly is. Also notice that it is none other than David, the king of Israel, who says, I will enthusiastically praise my God and king and bless your name forever and ever. What's interesting about that is, remember who David is. He's a king, king of Israel. And yet, despite being a king himself, David still recognized that God was his king. You know, I realize that many rulers of nations over the years have claimed to be Christian, but how many of them have actually governed according to Christian principles? Very, 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 very few. Now, I also know that nobody is perfect. Not even King David was perfect. In fact, he made a lot of egregious errors in his personal life, but David always repented of those sins. And he sought to live a life that was pretty pleasing to the Lord. Can you imagine having a national leader like that? It would be a blessing for the whole nation. But the take-home point for us is that everyone should recognize the one true God as our king. That everyone should bless his name forever and ever. Indeed, you should do it every day, according to verse 2. But why? Why should you do it? Why should you praise God? Why should you praise him every day? Look at Psalm 145.3. It's because the Lord is great. In fact, God is so great 
that it says his greatness is unsearchable. Now that's just another way of saying that the true greatness of our God is more than you and I can fully understand. That's what that means. During vacation Bible school, we talked about knowing who God is and how we can know who God is and how he has revealed himself in the Bible. We, we know because he's revealed himself in the Bible, who he is. And yet, while there's a lot of things uh, that we can know about God because of the Bible, let's also say, and this is true, we got into this a little bit in Sunday school this morning, the Bible has not explained God completely. Not explained him completely. As it says in John 21, 25, the world itself could not contain the books that would be written if you tried to explain everything that there is about the Lord. Okay, that's just the way he is. That's just how big he is. That's how complex he is. Just this past week, I uh, finished rereading the, the book of Job in my daily quiet time. And like every time I, I read a, reread a book of the Bible, I feel like I understand it a little bit better every time I read one. And the main point of the book of Job is that when bad things happen that you and I don't understand, we need to remember that there are things going on in the spiritual realm that you and I are completely oblivious to, and yet nonetheless, events in the spiritual realm still affect us in major ways, sometimes in very negative ways. However, God is still in control and will accomplish all of his good purposes. In, in that particular case, through Job's suffering, God proved to Satan that Job wouldn't curse God even if Job lost his health or his wealth. And that was a good thing, even though some of the things that happened to Job in order to prove that good thing were honestly quite bad. And thus, we're continually pointed back to God's promise in Romans 8, 28, that we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. If you truly love Christ, and yet something bad still happens to you, he promises that something good will come out of that bad thing. That's what our God is in the business of doing. He loves to fix broken things. He loves to fix broken people. And that's part of what makes our God so great. That's why we love him so much. Psalm 145.4 says, One generation will commend your works to another and will declare your mighty acts. This is the reason why we do Vacation Bible School. It really is. One generation has to tell the next generation about who God is. Because we've seen things God has done that they haven't seen yet. We've heard about things God has done that they haven't heard about yet. Because while creation itself proves that there's a creator, according to Romans 1.20, that knowledge can either be suppressed or twisted by sin unless we intentionally share the truth of God's word. And we need to share exactly what the Bible says. I know some say, we need to water this down. I know some say, well, maybe we should leave certain things out. I know some say, we need to accommodate to the culture when it comes to this. Because otherwise, maybe the next generation won't listen. No, 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 that is not right. We have to declare everything that the Bible says about who God is and what he has done. Will some reject it? Yes, of course. But we cannot be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, just like Romans 1.16 says. And therefore, given the importance of telling the next generation about who God is and what he has done, Psalm 145, 5 
makes a whole lot of sense that you and I need to meditate. You and I need to think about the glorious splendor of God's majesty as well as his wondrous works. But how do you do that? How do you do that? Well, it's by reading the Bible. It's by studying the Bible. It is by listening to the Bible, being taught and preached. Psalm 145.6 says that there will be people who speak of the might of your awesome deeds, of God's awesome deeds, and we need to listen to people who talk about that. Because the only way that you'll get to know God is by spending time in His Word. That, that, that's how you're going to get to know Him. You're not going to get to know Him any other way. The Christian faith is also very dependent on memory. Very dependent on memory. That's what Psalm 145, 7 teaches. When, when things go south, and, and it happens, it happens to all of us, things are going to go south from time to time. When things go south, you have to keep reminding yourself of the truth of who God is despite the challenges of whatever trial you are in because it's only in the truth of God that you're going to find hope in the midst of that trial. And one of the great aids that God has given us to assist our memory and thus give us hope, one of these great aids is song. Song. You know, speaking strictly in terms of ordinary human beings, David's importance in the Old Testament is only rivaled by Moses. And this is because David was the king through whom Jesus, the king of kings, would come. And, and, and the lives of Jesus and David mirror each other in several notable ways. But besides being a king, David was also a song writer, he was a song singer, and he was a song player. And David was all those things because songs can help us remember God's great goodness and righteousness. Uh, I, I remember reading a story here not too long ago about a, a uh, someone who wrote a uh, VBS curriculum for many, many years was riding on an airplane and uh, got talking with the person next to them. And of course, when you talk to somebody on the airplane, you always inevitably ask, you know, what do you do? What do you do? And, and, uh, and so this guy said, well, I actually wrote a uh, vacation Bible school curriculum for a very, very long time. And, and, and this other guy, he was not a, not a Christian, but... Um, he, he did go to vacation Bible schools. And uh, he remembered some of the songs that this guy wrote years ago. And, 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 and he could still sing them. He wasn't a Christian. But, but he remembered those songs. He, he could still recite parts of those songs. So, so many years later, it was a huge blessing to the, to the guy. Uh, and, 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 I, and I think he got to share the gospel with him. And I, and I think he wound up getting saved while they were on the airplane. But... But song is just a wonderful tool to, to, to help us to remember about who God is. Well-written songs help us remember who God really is. And who is the Lord our God? Look at Psalm 145, verses 8 through 9. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. The Lord is not only gracious, he is grace personified. Through faith in Jesus Christ, the, the penalty of our sins has been paid for, and you are given the hope of eternal life in heaven. The, the Lord is not only compassionate, he is compassion personified. 
Hebrews 4.15 teaches that, that Jesus can sympathize with you, sympathize with me, because he was tempted in all the ways you and I are, and yet was without sin. The Lord is not only patient, he is patience personified. As 2 Peter 3.9 says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but as long-suffering or patient toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord is not only loving, He is love personified. 1 John 4.10 This is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. The, the Lord is not only good, He's goodness personified. We already saw evidence of that in His promise to work out everything for good for believers in Romans 8.28. And lastly, the, the, the Lord is not only merciful according to that text, He is mercy personified. Because of our sins, you and I deserve to die and go to hell, but through faith in Jesus Christ, the penalty has been removed and we are saved. That's mercy. And this is why Psalm 145, verses 10 through 13 says, All you have made will praise you, O Lord. Your saints will extol you. They will tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all men may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and holy in all his works. The kingdom of God is coming. Are you a part of it now? Are you a part of it now? You can be. So long as you turn from your sins and trust in Jesus. Psalm 145, verses 14 through 16 says, The Lord upholds all those who fall and lifts up all those who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. Now it must be noted, that the deliverance promised here is specifically to all who call upon him, according to verse 18. And this means that, that God's promise of deliverance here is not given to, to non-Christians. Furthermore, this promise of deliverance hinges on the phrase proper time or due season in verse 15. This means that while all Christians are promised deliverance, we may not get it right when we want it. Because we have a timetable, usually immediately. I want to be delivered right now. <laughs> Take me out of this trial right now. That's our timetable. But some hurts, let's be honest, may not get fixed until we're in heaven. They will get fixed there. They will get fixed there. As Revelation 21.4 promises, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Oh, what great and precious promises we have in Christ Indeed, this all leads to the climax of David's song. In Psalm 145, 17 through 21, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving towards all he has made. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him. 
but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Have you called upon the name of the Lord? Have you cried out to him and been saved by him? If you have, your faith will be preserved. You will endure in your love of Christ until the end. But all the wicked who do not believe will get what they deserve. You sin against an eternal God, you get eternal punishment in the, in the fires of hell. And so call upon the name of the Lord and praise him like you should. Let's pray.